Welcome to Momentum Magnet, a podcast to inspire your growth. I'm Karen Morales, and your host in helping you find ways to make positive changes for your business, health, relationships, and life. We always have a path to a happier ending, so let's get started today. Good afternoon and happy Friday. Welcome to Momentum Magnet. Every week, we are here to give you tips on how to add more momentum and more growth into your life and business. Today's topic is something we can all relate to. What is the future of working from home? What does it mean if your company is considering or has called a permanent end to the office space and a return to continuing to work from your living room? Well, today we decided to go to the source. We've invited Bob Krinsky to join us as he has always run a healthcare strategy consultancy from a home office. His teams have always been remote and we're here to pick his brain so that we can always all leave with a better understanding of how do we make remote work work for all of us. Bob's background has been in many major companies in the world. He's led over 100 strategy engagements for Philips Healthcare, a three-year marketing transformation for IDEX Labs, and many gross strategy engagements for Quest Diagnostics. Over the past few years, Bob's partnered with Bain to deliver a gross strategy engagement um, initiated by Intuit CEO Scott Cook. Bob began his consulting career with Ideascope in 1987, based in both my current hometown of Boston and my previous hometown of San Francisco. He's focused his, pra- his practice on growth strategy and corporate innovation. I'm really excited to meet with Bob today and to help everybody understand how you can survive, thrive, grow a business, and be a happy and engaged worker no matter where you sit. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, Karen. Thrilled to be here. I am too. So I don't know about you, Bob, because you have been working from home for years. But one of the questions I get asked most from clients and colleagues in networking events and at our, you know, masked up soccer tournaments is, is this going to last? Am I ever going to go back to an office? And how am I going to continue to balance working and living in the same space. So I would love to start there and just have you explain to the listeners what has your work life looked like over the last decade or two? And how do you suggest that people start to reframe their expectations of managing that blurred line between life at home and life at the office? Well, I have genuinely had a surprising number of clients and friends say to me that in their next life, they would like to come back as Bob Krinsky. (laughs) And there's a reason for that because I have enjoyed unbelievable flexibility and working on my terms for since 1997, when I left a traditional office environment. Um, So so everybody, you have to hear that. We are talking to an original, an OG home-based worker who has been doing this for over 20 years. So everything you're going to say today, Bob, is should resonate with the people scared about this transition. So over those 20 years, tell us, what, what is the number one thing that you've learned about having this balance between life and work? Well, I feel like I'm always living and I'm always working. And (laughs) the two simply coexist. And let me give you some examples of that. Sure. Um, I do feel like I have been a very, very engaged dad from the start. My kids have only seen me working from home. I have two boys, now 126 and 121. Uh, In 1994, when my youngest uh, was born, 
I moved to something called Harry time. And I blocked out on the company calendar because it was, I was working at it at the time for Ideascope. That was a very virtual environment. And I uh, put on the calendar from uh, 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. Every day it was blocked out. I was off at the park hanging out with my son, Harry, because I was starting my day at 5 a.m. and working till 8, creating that window. And that was just one example of the kind of flexibility. And so now, 25 years later, I am incredibly close to my boys. Um, you know, that I'm very involved in their lives and always have been. So that kind of flexibility has just been invaluable. Uh, I've always been able to work when and where I want to work. And that has included everything from, we have a second home on the East Coast, uh, a beach house in Southern Rhode Island. I, this, this year I've spent three months uh, doing my work there. I feel like I live on the East Coast and the West Coast simultaneously. Uh, my kids will attest, nobody naps like dad. And I am pretty much napping just about every day at about 3 p.m. And so I've been known to lay on my office floor and cuddle with my dogs. I've been known to go upstairs and nap. Th these are the things that you just can't do in a traditional work world. Uh, I, I have been doing morning boot camps uh, since uh, for 12 years uh, in Golden Gate Park with a group of about 12 other people that I do at 815. And I'm able to walk the dogs, you know, throughout the day. So, and yeah, and sometimes I'm working till 10, 11 at night. I am often up at 5 a.m. Uh, I happen to be most productive in the morning. And so I take full advantage of that. Uh, so I can go on. There are, there are a number of other benefits that I think that I wouldn't choose to give up under any circumstances. I hear that. I, I really understand what you're saying because I've done it myself. I mean, I spent 20 years working for large consulting organizations and traveling a lot, being on the road. And even in progressive industries like advertising and marketing consulting, the idea of having a permanent work from home day was something that I had to fight for tooth and nail to be able to stay home after my first child and be home on Fridays, I had to take a pay cut. And although the actual work was still getting done at the same level, it was years before I could renegotiate that salary deduction simply because I chose to sit my body in a different location than what was predictable. So I see what you're, what you're saying in that when you're able to flip your mindset and understand that the two parts of your life will always be commingled when you move your office to your home. If you're willing to look at that as an opportunity, then I think you can be inherently successful for all the reasons that you just laid out. The fact that you can exercise, that you can stop for a personal appointment, that you can take a nap, that you can do a meditation, that you can have a long lunch. All of those beautiful perks are make it all the worthwhile, but you also have to be willing to get up at four o'clock in the morning if you need to finish a project and balance your personal results. What do you think it is for most Americans that are home for the first time that they're stuck on, that they need a different um, mindset sh shift to approach differently? So they start to think of the benefits of being in their home versus feeling like it's a working prison, which I've heard from a lot of people <laughs> recently. Yeah, well, um, a couple of thoughts. So it is different now that I am with our kids out of the house. However, I have been doing this, as you said, for 20 plus years and, and was doing it when they were young. Um, I have always had a separate uh, office that was... Bob's office, dad's office. Uh, in my current home, I actually have to walk outside and go downstairs 
uh, to be in the office I'm in now. So I am a big proponent of uh, having a place that you call work. Um, I think if you can look at things like, um, I can't think of a bigger waste of time than commuting. Yeah. There is nothing good about commuting. Mm -hmm. uh, the traffic I encounter on commuting is kids running up and down stairs when they were younger. Uh, so I would encourage people to fully embrace that. I would encourage people to be a bit more in tune with when they are most productive. We all have different work cycles and some of us work our, do our best work late at night, some early in the morning. It, you know, I would be tuned into that and honor that and let that be when you do your best work. Um, I also think to the degree that this is comfortable for people, uh, shorter spurts, you know, mm -hmm. work, work for two hours and then go hang out with the family uh, or go walk the dogs or do something that, you know, I don't mind my work day stretching from seven in the morning till seven at night if I've actually only worked eight hours during that window. I think that's a beautiful thing because when I first made the sw switch to working at my own company from my own house, I had a few moments of panic where I thought, how long did I even work today? Because it felt like I did a lot for myself personally and I got some assignments done. And the number one piece of advice that I received was just what you said. It's the small spurts of work. I have found out, especially from working home at home, that about 90 minutes is my max concentration on a, on a task. And if I can give myself 90 minutes on one thing, I can almost always make a huge dent in productivity where I feel like I can take a mental hiatus and come back to it and feel like my progress is almost double as impactful because you're focused for a small period of time. And I don't think enough people do that. I think they try to push through, tough it out. And I think if you think about your work, sometimes like a workout that, you know, you want to have a really effective afternoon writing a PowerPoint presentation, a 45 minute or a 60 minute focus session can sometimes be better than chipping away at it distracted for three hours. Yep. And I, you know, there is a concept called micro workouts where you literally stop working and do 60 seconds of jumping jacks or mm -hmm. 60 seconds of push-ups, and even little things like that, you know, do kind of break things up. The other point I would make is while traditional HR departments may not consider, uh, time in a shower, time doing dishes, time doing laundry, time walking the dog as productive work time. Uh, I happen to do a lot of thinking, work-related thinking when I'm doing those activities. And, and I value that, you know, work is work. Uh, I, don't, I don't really care what it looks like. Uh, and that's another mental shift. You know, you just kind of have to value the work that's being done whenever it's being done. It doesn't have to fit a traditional definition of work. Yeah, that's beautiful. So switching gears for a minute, we've given some people some advice on how to approach the work from home situation that many of us are in. But the second piece of the equation is if you are a business leader, if you are the CEO of an organization or a district office, how do you start thinking about what work would be like if you made the permanent decision to close office space? Given that you've worked with huge companies like PG&E, General Mills, Nokia, Bristol Myers, can you talk a little bit about how some of those discussions are happening at the senior levels of global organizations and some of the most important parts of the decision-making process that they need to consider if they decide to forego office space? Well, let me start by answering that 
by just looking a little bit at some of the advantages to the Krinsky company business and business model. Great. So first of all, uh, we are a team currently, we're a team of 12. Uh, we have a, a person on the team in Madrid, Spain, who, by the way, I have spent one hour face-to-face -face with when we met at a Starbucks in Boston. And she's been with us for a year and a half, and I have not been in the same room with her since. Uh, we have a couple people in New York, in Boston, in D.C., Las Vegas, Kalispell, Montana, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Uh, I feel like I have access to some of the most amazing talent because of our distributed model, because there's a whole workforce of really talented people out there who you can uh, tap 10 hours a week, 20 hours a week, 40 hours a week. I have two people on my team who are very committed to their acting careers. Mm -hmm. And they do strategy consulting, you know, 30, 40 hours a week on that. And I get to access that kind of creative talent. They've both worked in strategy consulting firms in the past, but decided to go in this more creative direction. Uh, I have a lot of new moms and, and a, a, a disproportionate number of women on the Krinsky company team where uh, of the 12 of us, uh, 10 are women. Uh, I'm no fool. Women should rule the world and are, are way smarter than, than us men. And I want to tap into that great talent. And I do. So there's access to amazing talent, number one. Number two, there's great flexibility to scale up and scale down as the business ebbs and flows. Uh, things did slow down for us in the start of COVID. Uh, of the 12 people, we probably kept six really engaged and six not so engaged. We're now ramping up. We're seeing a big surge, and we might be up to 18 people come January. And that sort of ebb and flow has been enabled by this distributed workforce that we're able to tap into. Um, there are, you know, things like no rent, no commuting costs. There are lots of tax benefits. I only put 5,000 miles a year on my car. It's good for the environment. You know, these are genuinely important uh, attributes to a business and a business model. I hear that. And I believe it because I've done the same thing with my business. I think what a lot of large organizations struggle with, and I would argue that they struggle with this even with their team members in the same building, is effective communication and a shared understanding of everybody's role in driving the business forward. So it would, um, it would be my understanding that a lot of big organizations think if they're already struggling maybe with operational efficiencies within an organization that six, sits together, could that actually get worse if they were remote? Well, I actually think it gets better. And I really do. So uh, my administrative assistant was the only person who actually did come to the house and work at the workstation beside me um, for the, from the start of the business until three years ago. And then I decided, you know what, I'm going to, uh, someone on my team suggested uh, rock solid virtual assistants. And a woman named Tracy runs rock solid virtual assistants. It's exactly as it sounds. And she put me in touch with uh, Wendy, my current assistant, she has been working for me for three years. She lives in Las Vegas. She has always been virtual and she does the work of three people. You know, the I, I talk to her every day, all day, whether it's through Slack, through Zoom, through my phone, through text messages. We are in constant communication. And I would say that uh, there are technology platforms now that make running a all virtual business so, so easy and scalable. So let me give you some examples. Please. Uh, 
we run our business on QuickBooks. Yeah. It's, it's all SaaS. I have dashboards. Uh, Wendy works with a remote uh, financial advisor who is advising her. Uh, everything we do is invoiced and paid through bill.com. Uh, we use Google Suites. So whether it's Google Docs, which is awesome for team collaboration, uh, everything's on a shared Google Drive, Google Calendar. Everyone can see everybody's calendar. We all use Gmail. We have the same uh, Bob at the Krinsky Company. Dot com uh, slack we have we're very team based in our work so you know there's a quest team slack channel there's a uh a Fresenius team slack channel so teams are really able to communicate with me and with uh each other effortlessly uh, we track our time we're a consulting firm we track our time on toggle which is the easiest time tracking platform on the planet. We've looked at many. We've been using Zoom since it started. So Zoom is not new to us, um, but it's amazing what is possible with Zoom, including we do a lot of calls that are recorded and then have people on the team who couldn't make that call listen to the call at their convenience. Mm -hmm. So there's really no need to even ever miss an important meeting. Um, It just allows for Total flexibility. We also use something called Upboard, which is a new platform founded by a friend of mine, which allows uh, for things to become more like command centers. So the Krinsky Company Command Center uh, is on Upboard. And we also use Mural, which is another team collaboration tool. So no matter where you are, honestly, I feel like, um, you know, by the time I'm done with a day's work, I am not craving more interaction with people. I, I've had enough. I'm interacting with people all day long. I think the beautiful thing about being more remote is that you have to be more purposeful about the connections, right? You can't just expect that you're going to grab lunch or get a coffee in the in the breakout room and that's going to provide your update for the day. I think by being more purposeful, we sometimes adapt greater structure and from that greater structure leads to better operational excellence. I mean, I certainly find in my own business and in my own life that I am actually more productive working from home because I am happier and because I can balance my home life in an easier way. It gives me more mental room to do the work that I love. I would also add, and I I don't know if this is because we're a small business or not, but I think because of our business model, we are a almost a political free environment. So think about what causes politics in an organization. Who's got the best offices? Who's got the best parking spaces? Who's included in a meeting that you walk past and see everyone in a boardroom meeting and you're not there. And then you start wondering why, why wasn't I invited to that meeting? You know, those are the kinds of things that take on, you know, become bigger than life. We don't deal with any of that. Uh, All of the Krinsky company employees are focused on doing the work. Right. It's very pure in that way. That's beautiful. That is really beautiful. So, I think we've established that both you and I have had a lot of success in our companies and personally working from home. We both believe that there are a lot of organizational opportunities for a company with a disparate workforce to organize around to make sure that people have a sense of teamwork and accountability and feel like they understand what's happening, even though they're not face to face. So as we look at the next five years and the trajectory of the United States workforce, what do you think are going to be some of the trends that we're going to see in, I don't know, larger areas of our economy? Is this something that you feel like will reverse itself when COVID ends? Or do you think a lot of companies are going to permanently pivot to a more remote based environment? Uh, I do think a more remote-based world is here to stay, and that's everything from telemedicine 
to teleworking. Um, I think face-to-face -face meetings will be far more purposeful mm -hmm. and there will be way fewer people uh, going to meetings face-to-face -face that they don't think they should have invested the time to get to. Um, and, and I do think face-to-face -face meetings are important and I do miss them. And I was recently uh, with a client in New York. It was my first face-to-face -face meeting with a client all year. Um, and it was, I loved it. And I rediscovered, you know, how much fun it is to have dinner with clients and to interact with them for a day. So it's not going away, but it's just going to be more, more purposeful. Um, and I also think that there are some really important enabling beliefs uh, that will enable that to thrive. So for example, I don't know that HR professionals in big companies are really great at this, but I trust and treat everyone as the adults they are. I don't spend a moment worrying, am I getting 40 hours of work out of people? Am I, you know, is everyone being productive? I'm not tracking anyone for anything other than billable work because we bill our clients for, for our billable work. Uh, uh, we don't have a vacation policy. We don't even have business hours. Uh, people work when they do their best work or when they are able to. And, uh, and I think that just implicit trust mm -hmm. is absolutely critical. And I think if, if all the Krinsky Company team members were polled, I think they would say they totally feel that. And if Big companies are not there yet. They need to get there. I, I agree with that. I mean, I know as I started my marketing magnet business, it was a big move. We actually pivoted from really talking about retainers based on hourly time periods. And we're really now we sell projects based on outcomes. So we give them a fixed rate for a project to get the outcome that they desire and my expectation for the consultants that I hire or the people on my team that work with me permanently is that if you agree to do the project, you get the work done against the timeline we've sold to the client. How you make those dates, when you do the work, how long it actually takes you does not matter to me as long as it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I see no reason why companies would go back to the way it was. I, you know, I think the pendulum definitely went like this. And I will also tell you, so Quest Diagnostics is one of our clients and we just did a piece of work where we were interviewing uh, global benefits leaders of Fortune 1000 companies. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions we asked them is, is remote work here to stay? And we got a resounding yes. So, you know, this is not just my point of view on this. I think that, um, I think it's just going to be more purposeful. Uh, I suspect places like WeWork, you know, when people are able to be more face-to-face, -face, those kinds of concepts will get more traction. Uh, because even having a place like we work uh, a day a week or just for client meetings, uh, that is what we used to do with we work before uh, COVID. Uh, Us too. And the beautiful thing about a we work space was no matter where I was in the world for a meeting, I could grab space at a we work office. We had one downtown Boston, but we could use it in New York or San Francisco or LA or London. So it was great to have that, you know, flexibility. So I do agree that that's going to be there to stay. And I think too, if you're listening to this episode and you're, you're not feeling the same bullish optimism that both Bob and I have for the work from home environment, one thing I'd like to, to say and stop on is that it, 
it is unprecedented right now that many people are dealing with working from home and homeschooling small children. Now, understanding Bob's kids are, you know, in college or out. So you don't have, you know, the, the five-year-old trying to do Zoom who can't read. Uh, that is a whole different part of the equation. So I do think if you're a if you are using your litmus test of what working from home is, and that includes having little people in the home that are trying to homeschool on Zoom, it's not necessarily a fair test of what the experience is for adults that are working from home without the added job description of educator. And I do think that's important because I think some people's views are clouded by the extreme circumstances that we're under in this ex- moment in time. Yes, I would completely concur. And I have said, both my wife and I have said to each other, could you imagine having small kids at home now that we had to homeschool? So yes, that would that would add huge amounts of complexity. If I was in that mode, you know, I think we would, of course, uh, lean on a nanny to the degree that People out there can, for those who can't, uh, you probably need some kind of a a morning huddle. What hours are you going to work today and take care of the kids? And what hours am I going to work today and take care of the kids? And, you know, it just has to be that much more collaborative and and team centered. But um, but you're still uh, not dealing with commuting. You're still able to, you know, and even in today's world, I've had many meetings where someone was holding an infant in their arms or dogs barking in the background because of delivery person. Like, I think that's fair game now. That's, 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 I think in many instances, charming. And I don't see that changing. Oh, I, I do. I love that more than anything. I mean, I've had some moments that were, you know, really interesting. My recent favorite was I was presenting to a large group and all of a sudden there was, you know, thumping and screaming in the next room. And I had to tell the audience that somebody was taking PE in the next room without a door and I needed to go on mute for a moment (laughs) and explain that PE while mom's leading a webinar is not the best plan. Uh, Also the the recorder practice, the, the instrument that was created to kill all parents at the same time with its beautiful vocal cues is also not my favorite uh, background soundtrack for, for meetings, but it does. I mean, it's levity, right? I mean, I've been in meetings with celebrities that have, you know, naked toddlers, you know, falling and climbing over them. And, you know, you make eye contact with someone that you wouldn't feel that sort of shared sense of authenticity. And you just kind of go, it's so hard. So hard. Yeah. So, it does bring out a more authentic connection. And I will also tell you that um, I have had a couple of meetings with clients, CEOs at their homes on their decks. And that opens up a very, um, uh, it's a much, uh, and I've offered to clients, hey, you wanna just meet while we walk. So it, it opens up different ways to engage with clients that I also think would not have been possible. I think there was, it was very early, early on in COVID and I just love this story. I wish I could remember what company it was, but it was a global multinational, like a household name that we've all heard of. And they were talking about um, on the nightly news, how all these CEOs were working from home and a lot of them had college kids. So they'd have three and four children home plus a working spouse. And it was this guy, I mean, let's just pretend it was Ernst and Young doing a live stream to his entire global offices from his laundry room, sitting next to the washer, being like, we're out of Wi-Fi. I've got three kids in college, <laughs> my wife teaching class, and this is my only place. It's me and the dog next to the dryer. Sorry. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And that is interesting. So let's leave everybody with a little... Bit. I like to make sure we're giving people a few uh, marching orders. So we've given them some great ideas. And when you're approaching home, you have to think about truncating your work into focused efforts. You have to be open and use the time that you're not commuting to get some of that balance back in your life by putting in things that you love. 
and that you can change your mindset on the connectivity between your teammates by approaching communication in new and different ways. And just because you're not seeing people face to face does not mean that productivity, uh, accountability or communication needs to suffer. We know that the global trends are looking really positive to this becoming part of our culture for all organizations of every size. So as we march towards the end of 2020 into 2021, potentially some states that maybe haven't had as many lockdowns look at resurgence of COVID and maybe some additional precautions. Is there anything that you think companies should be asking themselves right now as they prepare for 2021 when it comes to creating an effective culture in the remote work environment? Um, yeah, I do think uh, things like Zoom guidelines. Uh, I have heard people say, um, I've just gone nine hours from Zoom to Zoom to Zoom to Zoom. And I wasn't, I wished I had been more thoughtful or, or been willing to say, no, I, I need to build in, you know, Zoom breaks. So I, I think that's really important. You can't just do nine hours of these kinds of calls. I do think shorter sprints throughout the day, whether they're meetings or otherwise, is good counsel. I think even things like um, lights and external mics and paying attention to a more artful backdrop uh, is an important part of sort of the new office etiquette. Um, I think that uh, just having that mindset that you're gonna kind of, for whatever time frame works for you, I'm always living and I'm always working. And then when you're not working, to turn off your phone and to turn off your computer and to really not work, to really unplug, to take off your Apple Watch, to, uh, I do think that's, and, and the one advice I don't follow for myself is that electronic stuff should not be in the bedroom. And I wished I adhered to that. <laughs> I check my email in the middle of the night way more than I should. Oh, boy. All right, one last speed round question. Zoom meetings, videos on or off? Always on. I much prefer the connection. Beautiful. Well, Bob, if somebody wants to reach out to you to hear more about how the Krinsky Group has always been a remote workforce or hear about your healthcare strategy consulting, how do they reach out? Uh, assuming I won't get... Uh, 20,000 phone calls this afternoon. Uh, you can certainly text me 415-310-3776. And I can be emailed at bob at the .com, bob at the .com. And I am happy to answer any follow on questions uh, on either subject. That's fantastic. Well, we thank you, Bob, for giving us all of your insights on how to be an effective home worker and, you know, really talking about how much beauty it's added to your life over the last two decades, because I think it's important for people to refrain. We had a wonderful speaker come to my ch children's school this week and talk to the parents about resiliency, Dr. Bob Brooks. And he really said the number one trait shared by anyone who is quote unquote resilient is the ability to see the solution, not the problem itself. So with that being said, we are so happy to have you. And I thank everybody for listening to Momentum Magnet. We are here every Friday to talk to really interesting thought leaders in all sorts of industries so that you can apply new tactics and strategies to make better momentum in your life and business. We love follows, likes, comments, and reviews. And we hope that you reach out on iTunes, Spotify, and Pandora to tell us what you think of our recent episodes. We can be reached at www.momentummagnet.com. I'm Karen Morales, and I am your host. I am also the founder and CEO of Marketing Magnet, 
We provide boutique agency services to help clients solve their hardest marketing challenges. I can be reached there at marketing-magnet.com. All of the show notes will be included when we upload next Wednesday. Thank you, Bob, so much and have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you for listening to Momentum Magnet. We're here every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern time to share inspiring comeback stories. We want to hear your reviews and love getting your subscriptions on iTunes and Spotify. For show notes and past episodes, visit MomentumMagnet.com. I'm Karen Morales, keynote speaker, writer, and founder and CEO of Marketing Magnet, a fast-growing marketing agency for purpose-driven companies. Whether you are a business needing an agency or if you are looking for weekly tips to get ahead, sign up at marketing-magnet.com to receive our weekly inspiration on getting more in your life and business.